know, if I had a chance to, to start over right now, knowing what I've learned in this job, uh, you know, what would I do? What would the ideal firm look like that I wanted to work for? What types of projects would I want to take on? And what sort of impact would I want, you know, the, the let's call it the, the second chapter of my career to look like? This is episode 80. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears. Today we're going to talk with architect Scott Larrick. He's the founder and principal of the architecture firm 1159 Studio based out of Austin, Texas. Scott won the recent business plan competition put on by the Charette Venture Group. And in today's episode, I'm going to talk with Scott and you're going to discover how he found work for his young firm, what he went through to start up his firm, how he identified his target market and defined his niche, including his most successful business development efforts. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. For over 10 years, architects have relied on Archie Office to power their office and empower themselves. Go check it out at archieoffice.com. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, big fan of the show and can't wait to share some stuff with your audience. That's right. Make your dent on it. Leave your mark here on the show. So tell me, 1159 Studio, tell us a little bit about, just to give us a brief overview of what you guys do. So I'll give you the, I'll try to try to give you a brief synopsis of uh, my professional career to date. So I started off after school working like a lot of people did in a very traditional sort of mid-sized architecture firm back on the East Coast, did uh, sort of ground up mixed use development projects for about six years. And... Uh, at some point, just decided, you know, they're great people, it's a great firm, they do good work, and just decided for me personally that uh, it just, it wasn't fulfilling in the way that I had, you know, sort of always hoped that my career in architecture was going to be. And what, I'm going to just, pardon the interruption, but sure. what, when you say fulfilling, you know, what, what did you hope that it would be? Well, so my, my educational background was in the area of sustainable design and sustainable technologies and, you know, basically looking at architecture as a tool to solve problems, be they, uh, you know, social problems or environmental problems, that sort of thing, or how we could at least, you know, sort of mitigate the impact of the built environment. Um, the, the work that, uh, I ended up doing for a few years was just not in that, uh, in that realm. You know, it was private development that basically existed to make people with a lot of money more money and, uh, those, those other sort of concerns about how that impacted, uh, the built environment and the communities that these projects went into was not, wasn't at the forefront of the projects. So, Sort of freaked out, quit my job, uh, went and backed around, backpacked around Europe for a couple months, and then relocated here to Austin about three years ago. Why Austin? So, sort of hit the ground here. And, why, why Austin, Scott? Uh, Austin just sort of, you know, there was a lot going on in Austin as of three years ago. I mean, there still is now, but, um, you know, I made a short list of the, the qualities that I wanted in a place to live as far as you know, the, the education of the population, job opportunities, weather, that sort of thing. And Austin just came out on top. And so, um, yeah, it's been fantastic. Austin's been a very welcoming community so far. And I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, that this is where the, the finger landed on the map. All right. So you settled down in Austin and. What? Yeah. And so, and so the, you know, I had a unique opportunity, I think, to sort of to, to recalibrate. You know, I'd already uh, gained some some technical expertise in the field of architecture and seen the way that a business works from the inside, and been a part of some really interesting, successful projects, and and had an opportunity to to take a step back and to recalibrate and say, you know, if I had a chance to to start over right now, knowing what I've learned in this job. Uh, 
you know, what would I do? What would the ideal firm look like that I wanted to work for? What types of projects would I want to take on? And what sort of impact would I want, you know, the, the let's call it the, the second chapter of my career to look like? And um, so that's where 1159 Studio came from. That was, uh, you know, it, it really started with, with uh, nothing but me and a laptop and my cat in a small apartment in South Austin. And, yeah, so the, the mission of, uh, of this company, of this firm, really is to try to develop design projects that have an impact. Yep, yep. Well, and I just want to tell our listeners that uh, Scott Larrick is uh, the, the winner of the Architecture Business Plan competition that was recently uh, just recently happened. We're going to get in getting to some very cool things that Scott has been up to. So um, hang on the line because you have, you're have really looking forward to something, um, some interesting information here. And Scott, now I something you said earlier, you said you have a small collective of designers and architects when, you know, the introduction you gave me to, to, to read out. So could you describe to us what, what that means, a small collective of designers and architects? Well, so it's a it's a very sort of uh, non traditional setup to our firm. Um, you know, right now uh, I'm I'm essentially functioning as the only full time employee. Uh, we have built up over the past three years a network of people in all sorts of backgrounds that we work with on a project by project basis. The the point being that we try to bring in the exact sort of level of expertise on an individual project that we need and not, you know, and, and not have people around on staff that we don't necessarily need on every project. So a lot of these, these people that uh, are either consultants or functioning as, uh, you know, working with us on a contract basis, um, we've just found to be a better, a better model and it, it better serves the sort of mission that we're trying to accomplish. So we've got, uh, We've got builders and we've got artisans and craftsmen and other architects that, uh, that we engage on a specific project based on the needs of that project. And so right now your legal structure is what of the firm? Uh, we're set up as, a, uh, as an LLC. Okay. And how many owners are there in the LLC? Uh, there are technically two owners. It's myself and my wife. Okay. So, and your wife, is she also an architect designer? No, her background actually is in, uh, well, she's got a wide-ranging background. She currently is in the field of sustainability. She's, um, she's done some sustainability coordination for some groups here in town. And before that, we actually met at the old architecture firm that uh, I was working at before I left the East Coast, where she was doing marketing business development. So she has a background, um, you know, in a lot of areas that help us out now. Um, yeah. Sounds like that's, uh, you guys make a good team and a well-rounded. Yeah, I think we, uh, <laughs> I think we've been around each other enough to know sort of, uh, each other's strengths and when to get out of each other's way. So, uh, that, uh, so, so far it's, it's worked. Nice. So let's dive a little bit into Scott, what you saw about the traditional architecture route, which is definitely, something that we've seen a lot of in the past, and they still exist, traditional firm where they're based on hiring the best talent and having a, a staff you know, in-house. I think I'm starting to see more and more people venture out into having more of a horizontal type of organization, like you said, where yeah. people are brought on and um, depending on the, the particular project. But just talk to me about when you sat down and kind of outlined your ideal firm, what you wanted this thing to look like, what did it look like, what does it look like? Sure. Well, you know, the, the sort of structure of, the, of the, the studio right now for us is, was really born out of necessity. You know, in the, uh, you know moving to a, to a new city where we didn't know anyone, we didn't have professional contacts to lean on and trying to get an upstart, uh, you know, design business off the ground. Yeah. We just, you know, it was out of necessity. We didn't have the ability to take on employees or, or to try to build it larger. So we had to, to get a little more creative about how we were going to, um, 
get work done. You know, if we were able to find projects, we needed a, an, an infrastructure that would allow us to scale up and down very quickly and, and to be flexible in that way. And so uh, I, I totally agree with you. A lot of uh, people that I talk to, especially younger people or people that are looking to do work that is maybe less traditional than the sort of uh, stuff that most um, established firms go after, uh, they're looking for that flexibility too. You know, they don't, uh, you don't necessarily know when and where your next project is coming from. And, and so, uh, that, that flexibility is, is attractive, you know, because it allows us to make decisions with the business based on the type of projects we want to go after, not based on a certain level of overhead that we need to maintain or a certain, um, you know, we're not beholden to, uh, a huge payroll or something like that that would probably influence our decision-making process when it came time to either go or not go on a lot of projects. So that was that that was definitely a uh, a thought from the beginning is that we thought the greater flexibility in the structure of the studio itself would allow us flexibility in the type of work that we that we ended up taking on. Yep. So you can be more strategic about the kind of projects you go after. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it allows us, you know, it, it sort of grants us uh, a bit of walkaway power and a bit of uh, the power of no that a lot of traditional architecture firms don't have because they, they do have ongoing needs and ongoing, um, you know, there's a lot of spreadsheets and they need to they need to fill in a lot of numbers and they need to hit a lot of targets. And we're just, yeah, you can, it, it's just different. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but we feel lucky that, that we – get to make our decisions based on other criteria just than uh, the bottom line and our you know, gross revenue for next month. Sure. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. So you're so one month you're sitting on the French Riviera or you're Barcelona. The next month you're sitting in an apartment in Austin with your laptop and a cat, I think you said. So yeah. where did you, you know, how did the firm grow? Where did you get your first project? Uh, so really the first project and the first couple of projects uh, came from other architects in town, believe it or not. That's, uh, I think, uh, I wouldn't have thought when I was working for a larger firm that that was a common sort of path for startup firms to take, but uh, it sort of worked out that way for us, where the first couple of projects... You know, the first couple of months that we were down here was a lot of uh, a lot of cold calls, which really had almost zero success rate and then getting out and just meeting some people. So meeting other architects in the community, going to the local chapter, the AIA and uh, just sort of hitting every way that we knew how to get in touch with other people that were in this industry. And so the, the first few projects came from other architects that were uh, either overloaded with work at the time or had received work, uh, you know, that came across their desk that wasn't exactly their expertise or they, you know, just weren't interested in, in taking it on at the time. Yep. Yep. So, so, so I'm sorry, but, um, for, well, let me, for, let so me pause for, a just for a second, because sure. you said, you said you first tried cold calling. Was that your first kind of marketing effort, man? I'm just going to pick up the phone and start phoning around. That was that was that was one effort. So okay. one, you know, one strategy was to just sort of get in touch with the other people, you know, basically with the, the design community in Austin and to see if anyone had this sort of, you know, overflow of work or had a or if we could creatively partner with another firm, because um, as I mentioned, you know, my my background was in ground up mixed use developments with a, a, a focus on sort of uh restaurant, retail, hospitality, design. And there's a lot of that work going on in Austin right now. There has been for several years. So I thought it was a reasonable assumption to think that, uh, you know, just as we don't want to sort of box ourselves in by hiring employees right off the bat, there's a lot of 
small to mid-sized firms that are also looking for contract help on, you know, they want to ramp up on projects too without having to make that commitment. So, yeah, that was that was one angle that we were working from the get-go. So the, the cold calls you were making were to other architecture firms primarily? Right. We, we, we decided not to initially start looking at any sort of, you know, public RFPs or to start getting in touch directly with uh, the sort of end clients because I, I just, I, I don't, I've never seen cold calling, you know, to those people be effective for, for a landing project. So I thought the, the most logical strategy at the beginning was just to get in touch with people on the design side and see if we could, you know, create a strategic partnership or really just to lend a hand. Okay. And you said that those cold calls didn't go anywhere, but then when you started meeting people face to face, you started getting some some leads. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think that's always, uh, you know, anyone who has to do this this type of marketing business development would would say the same thing. I think you know, that meeting someone face to face is probably worth a uh, hundred cold calls or cold emails. So, yeah, it's just. Uh, you know, it's just about getting out into the into the design community, and, and through that, you meet people that are that are end users or clients and are developing projects, and just it all happens sort of organically. You know, one thing leads to another, and one contact leads to another, one project leads to another. And it wasn't easy, uh, yeah. it, and it was definitely a, a very slow start, but. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes, you know, like I said, luckily we had the ability to, uh, built in to sort of start slowly. And, um, yeah, just uh, the, the sort of tenacity to, to stick with it, you know, and not second guess whether it was ever going to work or not. Yeah. How long, did you, how long would you say it took from the moment you got back to Austin and got in that apartment to the time where, your cash flow was such that it was covering your living expenses. Uh, probably within, I would say, three to four months, it was covering uh, what what was, you know, a very very modest living expense at that time. But yeah, uh, yeah so uh, we, we, you know, we, we were making ends meet within three or four months. Okay, so you started getting some projects from other architects who either needed contract help or maybe they had a project that wasn't right for them and they sent those on to you? Yeah. Okay. How did it grow from there? Well, I just, uh, you know, that's that sort of fast forwards us, I would say, from, from that point to about a year ago where um, in that span of time, we were basically just functioning almost as, you know, architectural mercenaries, basically taking on just about any type of project we could get, you know, with, with the, as I mentioned before, the end goal of being to get to a point where the, where the business was sustaining itself and where we could really the, the goal from the beginning was to try to develop our own projects so that we wouldn't be out there beating the pavement and competing against everybody else in town for the same type of work. And so, that sort of, you know, leads us to about a year ago where we started developing the ideas for some of our own projects. Okay. And what was it that initially kind of turned you on to think about, man, if we develop our own projects, this is the direction we want to head down? Um, It's really, I, I think, boils down to a, a desire for more more control, you know. Uh, and and I don't mean that as in working for clients is you know a pain or or is is something that we uh, don't don't enjoy. But what we realized was that after a few years of sort of just making ends meet we found that we still couldn't find the type of projects that we genuinely wanted to be working on. Um, our, our sort of desire was to do something on a, on a scale that was a bit larger and was, was having more of an impact, more of a social impact and more of an impact on environmental sustainability than we were really 
finding out there in the marketplace. And, uh, and so, you know, there was just sort of a, another reevaluation of where we were at as a business, what we were doing in our day to day lives and whether or not we were enjoying that. And, uh, and we finally came to the conclusion that if we wanted to the type of projects badly enough, we thought that we just, you know, who better to, to sort of make them happen than ourselves. So a year, so we go back about a year ago. Is that about the same time you started uh, developing the business plan that you eventually submitted to the business plan competition? Yeah, I was going to try to tie that in. So, so we had actually begun working on a strategy prior to registering for the architecture business plan competition that, uh, that would become our entry for the competition. Um, so uh, without getting, you know, too, too deep into the details, what we wanted to start doing was designing and building actually. So our, our plan was to design and build small sustainable homes. Uh, Austin has this weird quirk in the land development code that allows what's called an accessory dwelling unit, an ADU, which in other places they're known as uh, alley flats, granny flats, secondary apartments. So on a single family, residential lot, you can technically have two separate homes. Uh, we, we found this niche in the market, and we thought it was just sort of a, the perfect test piece for us to put into action some of the principles that, uh, that sort of guide our, our work and, and what, we want to, what we want to do. Our, our philosophy is that you know, people should live smaller and that it's a more sustainable way of developing and a way of infilling the, the residential options in a city to offer um, smaller living spaces, you know, for young people that don't necessarily want to move out to the suburbs and get a, uh, a, a 2,000 to 3,000 square foot house for their starter home. And so, you know, that and then just paired with uh, sort of, the cutting edge of sustainable design technology and, and making these things carbon neutral, net zero energy, and just trying to, to be as responsible with the resources that we're using as possible. And so all of that sort of came together into a plan that we were, you know, we, 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 we developed this idea and we shopped it around to a few people and no one else was really interested so that's when we when we came to the conclusion that the only way we were going to do these projects and get them built was if we figured out a way to to develop the projects ourselves. What kind of people did you shop around to? So we we talked to some residential developers, and if anyone out there knows what's going on in Austin right now, there's just this unprecedented sort of boom in population and uh, economic development, the fastest growing city in the country right now. And with that, you know, comes the type of development that uh, that needs to keep pace with that. So there's a lot of suburban track housing being built. There's a lot of uh, sort of light commercial infill to support all this uh, growth and population. So we reached out to, to a few contacts of ours in the residential development world. And, you know, basically no one was interested because they're, they, uh, they, they want to max, they want to maximize their profits. You know, they're set up as, as businesses that are looking to, uh, impact their bottom line more so than impact the, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, social economic justice that we thought was, was that we wanted to be built into this type of development. I mean, another large feature of our, our business plan was to offer these things affordably and to try to maintain the existing fabric of Austin neighborhoods by not uh, displacing anyone who can't afford these overpriced new developments. So it, it really came down to a money issue. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're a business out there that's running strictly for profit and you have the choice between uh, building something at a slightly higher cost per square foot and then selling it below market value, market rate, uh, that, that doesn't sound, that's, that's not really a, a good sell for a lot of residential developers. And, uh, yeah, so we, uh, we decided just to, to take it on ourselves and, and try to figure out how to finance these projects ourselves. 
All right. Well, that's probably a good spot to to finish this portion of the interview. We'll we'll pick up again, uh, you know, in, in the the next episode where we dive a little bit more into the specifics of the plan. How does that sound, Scott? Sure, sounds good to me. Okay. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.